I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. To be the best in the world at something, I always knew it requires a lot of skill, some talent, a lot of hard work, but I never realized how much mindset is important and what is mindset and how do you get confident? And how do you feel optimistic when sometimes it feels like there's nothing to be optimistic about? I never realized the critical role this played in peak performance, no matter what it is you're trying to be good at. I've had a lot of chess coaches over the past 30 years. And right now I've been working with one of the best coaches I've seen in any field ever. It's one of the strongest players in the world, Grandmaster Avatik Gregorian. He runs their site, chessmood.com, and his whole thing is right mood, right move. And his site, if you visit it, and by the way, today is their fifth year anniversary. They're unlocking all their courses for free today. But if you visit their site, chessmood.com, it's incredible. It's hundreds of hours of videos, and it really, no matter what your level is, it teaches chess. And, it's, and you also get a sense, this is a guy who's not only gotten great at chess, but he's read every self-help book out there. He's a huge fan of many of actually former podcast guests on this podcast, whether it's Derek Sivers or Ryan Holiday or Tim Ferriss. But uh, I was curious to hear his story. He was a poker champion, a chess champion, and now an extremely successful chess coach. What does it take to have peak performance? So here's Grandmaster Avatik Gregorian on the fifth year anniversary of his coaching site, chessmood.com. And we have a great discussion about peak performance. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Avo, how's it going? Very good. Today I was listening to your interview with that crazy guy. I couldn't believe it. it was like, really, it's like you recorded and put it, Andrew Schultz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it's pretty funny. He's He's got a crazy style. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I had, I got a good mood. It was so like, so like real, so open. A lot of people still listen to that one. And uh, Jay, we should get Andrew on again at some point. But let me ask you this. You've been a champion of chess, one of the best chess players in the world. You've been a professional poker player. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, you would wake up at like, when you started Chess Mood, your coaching site, 
you would wake up at like four in the morning to play poker to pay the bills at chess mode. Uh, yeah, four, four, usually four, but there were days where three or two, but usually four, right? And, and how many, how many tables would you play at a time? On average 20. So it, I would have two monitors and I would play on average on 20 tables. 20 tables. So it's like online. What if one of the tables, your it's your turn to bet. Would you ever run out of time on that table? Theoretically, I could play even on 40 tables, but then I would run out of time. So I found that the sweet spot is for me is 20. So on 20, I am optimal unless you want to go to toilet. <laughs> and what would be the, what would be like the average amount you would win per day? I'm just curious. Maybe, you know, obviously some days you would lose, some days you would win, but at your peak, like what were you winning per day? Oh, there are days you lose a lot. There are days you win a lot. So on average, you win and lose thousands. Wow. So, so like you win 2,000, the other day you lose 2,000 <laughs> and so on. And we'll get to chess in a second, but like, let's say you lost 2,000. Would you ever get like super disappointed or afraid? Like, would you think, oh my gosh, if I lose $2,000 a day, I'm never going to be able to afford whatever it is? Um, one of the things... I did not bad. Uh, I learned about bank management and risk management. So I understood how to manage my risks. And I understood that if I, if I lose $10,000 a day, yes, that's, that's a lot. But $2,000, it was in, in the risks. So I understood the math very, very carefully. And I was okay. I was okay most of the time, unless you lose 2020 days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, were you ever afraid? You're, let's say you lost three days in a row. Were you ever afraid, oh my gosh, if I lost 20 days in a row, I'm I'm screwed? Uh, no, not, not really. I, I understood the math. I understood the math, what's what's happening. And like to lose 2,000, it was the maximum I could lose in one day. So theoretically, it's like very 0.0.1% like chance that I can lose three days in a, like, in a row like that. But yeah, once I had an accident that I lost more because I was playing on 20 tables and... Hey, I'm human, so I had to go to toilet at some point. <laughs> Usually, I try to not drink much uh, uh -huh. to avoid water or coffee, but I had to go. So how you do that? You turn off the laptop from the monitors. So all 20 tables are on your one laptop. And with one hand, you you grab your laptop and you go to the toilet. And then somehow I dropped my laptop. Oh. And then all the 20 tables where there was bad because I, I was playing tournament so you pay for the tournament and there is no way out so my laptop was broken for a week and i lost all that so that was a disaster <laughs> oh my gosh like did you get would you get like angry at your girlfriend or wife or whatever when that happens um usually usually i laugh when such things happens i i, tr I try all my life to take things easy so usually my first thing think whenever such things happens i just laugh like loudly i laugh <laughs> You know, okay, I've noticed this with your chess. Like when I watch you play, like a video of you playing chess and you lose, like sometimes, you know, like anybody, you'll make a mistake. And I do notice that you laugh. Is the laugh like to convince yourself that things are okay? Or is the laugh sincere? Are you really laughing? Because it's like so ridiculous, the mistake you made. It's probably 50-50. It's uh -huh. probably 50 50. Sometimes I just laugh like how I could how, how I could do that, how I could, how, how how this can happen, how I could just leave that laptop from my hand. Uh, but part is just to keep myself in a good mood. If I don't keep myself in a good mood, if I don't cheer up myself, who will do? It? And I had this uh, this analogy in my mind. It's I'm always trying to imagine that they are. My brain consists from one million small minions, like that uh, cartoon. Huh. So this, 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 these are my soldiers. These are, these are my army. But they are kids. They are like babies. They don't understand much. So I need to, I need to make them happy. So if they are disappointed, they don't come with me to the war. No matter I play poker, I play chess, I do whatever. So these little minions, I always need to make them happy. I need to explain why we want to do that. And they need to have fun. So if I don't entertain them, if I don't laugh and they are disappointed and like, oh, I think we don't play with this, I lose them. And if I lose them, I lose everything. So with this, I am trying to cheer up me and my minions in my head. <laughs> right. So, so this is a great analogy. Like, I love this analogy of that whenever you go into a situation where your total 100% performance is required, 
you need these million soldiers or minions to be working for you. So what could get in the way? Like relationship troubles could get in the way, work troubles could get in the way, your your feelings about the game could get in the way, or if you're tired, it could get in the way. Like, what do you do to keep all these so like a let's say, let's say you just had a fight with somebody, like you're uh, you know, someone listening to this that had a fight with their boss or their wife or husband or whatever. What do they what can they do to keep like the soldiers, uh, the minions? you know, happy? Well, that, that's, a, that's a tough talk with a kid, right? <laughs> it's tough talk. So usually I try to avoid such big conflicts and I usually I don't have. Most of the talks with the minions are coming uh, from from initial point when I'm going to start something. I'm like, come on, like today we have a discussion. Come on, all minions, listen to me carefully and they are okay. Tell, tell us. And I'm like, we are starting poker career. And they're like, what? So I need to explain them why do we start? Why this all thing? I, I, I'm like staying there and they are very carefully listening to me. And if, I, if my pitch is good, if, my, if I convince with my pitch them, they're like, yeah, let's play poker. Or, <laughs> let's, guys, we are starting chess mode. If I explain why, like that's why that, that many like have that. If I, if I explain why we do that, that's the most important for, part for me. Uh, and let, let, just just like you explain a kid, yeah, why why you should eat that that food because you will take them to the zoo at the end because you will have ice cream. Yeah, I'm talking with them. Like if it does that, if it, if it all goes well, this will happen. We are going to do that, 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 and they are yeah, let's do that. Uh, and and the same way, if something goes badly and they are disappointed, just like imagine your kid is disappointed. How you talk to them, you explain them like it's okay. We are going to cover this. And uh, better will be good, it'll take less. And so it's tough talk. Mm. Usually if one million are set, I'm not bringing immediately all of them. Maybe half of them I'm bringing. Another half maybe are crying. Another half are, are angry at me. But slowly, slowly I'm trying to bring them back because this is my army. This is who will be with me all the time. And how long have you had this analogy? Like when you first started playing chess, did you have this analogy? No, I was unfortunately or fortunately, because unfortunately that, if I, if I knew many things that I know now, my chess career would be in a different place. But maybe fortunately, because I left professional chess career and I don't mind at all, I'm happy where I am now. So no, I, I, I learned most of the stuff between playing poker and becoming an entrepreneur and starting chess mode. And, you know, when you first started playing chess, did you... Did, you, were, did people around you tell you you were talented? Like, how did you feel that first encouragement to feel like, okay, I'm really going to go for this. And your, your dad played chess, right? Yeah. So how, how this, this all started it because uh, in the nine, 1990s, we had a war with our neighbor country. And my father is a doctor and he's a patriot. And he said, I'm going to war. And he, he left. He, he, he went to the war for a, year, for a few years. And that time, our country was in economic crisis. Imagine we had water and electricity for just uh, two hours a day. And my mother in the two hours should cook, clean, wash all the things. And so we were living with my mother, my grandmother, and my little sister. So I was four, my sister was two. Uh, and in order to somehow entertain me, my grandmother taught me to play chess. Uh, I don't know how did that happen. My grandmother was not good, she just knew the rules. But I won her the first game. Hmm. Um, and then I won her again, 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 to the point when it became not interesting to me. And then my grandmother taught me to play backgammon. Uh, so in backgammon, there are also luck and so on. So with backgammon, we played for years until my, my father came back from the war. And he saw that, oh, I, I play chess, I know the rules. And my father was a big fan of chess. He had lots of collections of the book. He, he is good. He is around master level. He never had a title, but he is about master level. He saw I'm playing chess. Uh, it was his love. So his son was taking his passion. And he took me to chess school. Uh, because it was from one, one point, it was passion. And from another, it was uh, when he came back, uh, the country situation was not good. Nobody had really works. They don't have jobs. So... My father took me so he will have more time to find a job and to do things. So he took me to chess school and from there my journey started. But the point where I 
people thought that I am talented. Probably it came that I won the first game I ever played against my grandmother who taught me to play chess. And that, you know, let me ask you though, like when you say your dad went to a war for years, like did he, did you not see him for years? Yeah, I didn't see him for, for years. I was in kindergarten and I don't vividly remember that. Barely I remember that. They tell me this story. So I was in the kindergarten uh, and my fa- I'm already about six and my father is coming back from the war with, with huge beard, like mm-hmm. huge, and coming and saying, okay, I came for, uh, for Ava. And the t- teacher came and said, okay, there, there, there is your daddy came. I looked at him because I was, I was told that if somebody comes and say, I'm your dad, don't go. I look at him like, who is this? No, I said, no, 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 he's not my dad. I didn't recognize my dad. Huh. He was with beard and I didn't see him two years. He just came, he looked at me, into my eyes, yelled at me and said, look into my eyes carefully. I'm your dad. And they looked at him, yeah, yeah, he's my dad. So I hacked him and he took me to home. My grandmother ran to us uh, with crying, with tears in, ha- in, in ears. And um, my, my father is turning around and like, look, Grandmother recognized me. How you didn't recognize me? And I'm like, no, grandmother recognized me, recognized you because I was with you. <laughs> and I mean, did you feel bad when he said that? Like, did you feel like he was? Uh, I I don't I don't very vividly remember things. I barely remember as that, that incident that there was a beard with huge beard guy came and say I'm your daddy and he yelled at me. I barely remember that, so don't remember it. And. You know, Armenia is not like a very big country. Where was he that he couldn't like visit home during the years that he was at war? Uh, so there was a conflict with this Nagorno-Karabakh with, with Azerbaijan. So it is about 600 uh, kilometers from country. And it was uh, rough war and he just couldn't come back. Yeah. Like two years, two, like he, he was there for three years. At, at one point he came back, but then when I was four, I didn't see him for two years. And obviously some part of you knew that he was interested in chess. Like you said, there were chess books all around. So you think playing in, this is sort of almost a cliche to say, but do you think like playing chess and feeling good at it was almost like a little bit of a replacement for your father? Like this was your way of having him around mentally because you knew that this was something you could share? No, actually how I took this uh, closer to heart, as they tell me this story, is that when my father came and he was trying to find jobs and he was all the time busy with doing few few things, I found a trick to make him to spend time with me. So I would take the chess board and go to my daddy and say, let's play chess. This was something he couldn't resist. If I, if I was bringing my toys, cars, and like, father, let's play with like, sorry, I, I'm busy. But when I was taking chessboard, he would like leave everything, all the instruments he had on his hand and, and said, okay, let's play chess. So this is how I got, I, I found a way to get connected with my daddy, whom I miss so much, and to spend time with him. And when did you first beat him? I was probably 10. He, he was strong. So when he, when, we were, when he was playing with me, in order not to just win me all the time and I lose the interest, and also, so he, not, he doesn't play like in, intentionally weak. He would remove many of his pieces from the board. Mm. So he would remove not just queen. <laughs> queen is huge, right? But he would, I was beginner and he was master. He would remove queen to rooks, bishop. <laughs> and he would play with just few minor pieces with me chess. And the rule was this. If I win him three times in a row, he adds one more piece. Mm. And th- so this way I had the challenge three times in a row to win him. So he had some more piece. And then he eventually added all the pieces. And then eventually he added his last night. And then we started to play one-on-one. And then eventually I, I, I won him the first game. But I wouldn't won him that first game. I would just stop playing chess. Uh, if there was not that incident when he took me to my first tournament. And the first game I ever played in the tournament, I lost. If I didn't lose, if I won that, maybe I would just, ah, right, it's easy game. It's, nah, I, I won my grandmother. It's like I'm winning them. But when I lost, I took it too ser- so seriously. So probably that, that had its impact that I continued playing trust. 
And 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 it was after that first loss that that you beat your dad, or uh, I, when I played that first game, it was I was about six. The first time I just won my father when he had all the pieces, all his chess yes. army on the board. I was about ten, so about many many years. And did did he feel bad? Was he happy? Were you happy? Like what happened? Like after you first beat him. Um, he, I, of course, he was, he was happy. Like, yeah, his son finally beats him. Um, but the, the day I remember that I beat him, it was he was playing without a rook. And if I if I win him three times in a row, he would buy me a table billiard. Hmm. You know, w- when I was a childhood, like you can imagine the situation in in not good economical country. Father is not at home. We barely were surviving. So naturally, I didn't have many toys. And even now, the people who are very close to me uh, on my birthdays, they they give me toys because I still have that. I miss that. So on on Chessmood's birthday last time, I bought a table hockey so we play games. So that was still in me. And if I if I win my father without if I won my father without a rook, uh, he would he would win me. He would buy me a billiard table like table billiard. I was so excited about that. And I couldn't win him three times in a row. I would win two and then lose, two and then lose. And then finally I won him the third game in a row. And I was just jumping in, the, in my place, running around. Yeah, I will have a billiard, table billiard. And then and then he bought me the table billiard. Did he, I mean, was it actually like a pool table, like, like a big table in the house? No, just small, small tables, like small that you can put put on the table and just play, like very small for for kids, not not, not nothing big. Um, probably the the kids, uh, they would laugh now at me so, so on on what I was happy, but on my childhood I didn't have I didn't have toys, so that was a huge thing for me. Did you know several industries are heading for a hiring boom this spring, like e-commerce and healthcare? Surprisingly, hospitality is one of the areas with the most growth. The hospitality industry needs to hire for service positions, managerial positions, and back office operations positions as well. If you need to hire qualified candidates ASAP for any of these industries or any other industry, you need ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash James. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful matching technology to find the most qualified candidates for a wide range of roles. ZipRecruiter makes it easy to send promising candidates a personal invite so they're more likely to apply. Plus, ZipRecruiter offers attention-grabbing labels like urgent, training provided, remote, and more that speak to job flexibility. I've talked to CEOs who have used ZipRecruiter, and the reality is, for some reason, it is hard. Like everyone says, oh, there's a recession. Not true. It is hard to find qualified candidates right now, and unemployment is at a 50-year low. So you need to use whatever you can to find qualified people to fill jobs. So let ZipRecruiter keep your team growing strong no matter what the industry. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address right now or after you finish listening to this podcast to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash James. I'm the only James that they know. So again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash J-A-M-E-S, James. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We wanna care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity and I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best 
to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So obviously playing your dad, you're motivated to win. You, you were getting rewarded with toys. What happened when you started playing in tournaments a lot? Like, how did you improve? How much do you think was talent versus working hard at it? Like, when did you have to start really working hard at it? Um, the, the first thing is was that I lost my first ever game I played. So I wanted like, ah, okay, so they are better at me. And I felt, I don't know how, but I objectively felt that he was just very strong. He just crushed me. It was not he accidentally beat me. He would beat me 10-0 if he played more. Mm. So I felt, okay, because there was a kid who was my age and he beat me. They are so strong. Okay, I'm going to beat them. And I started to train. And uh, then how it happened, I played Armenian Championship until 10, my first ever tournament uh, in Armenian Championship, and I, and I got the third place. And I was like, okay, and I was this, so this close. This is under 10 years old. Under 10 years old, yes. Yeah. Under 10 years old. They were like, okay, I was so close. Let's prepare, let's train, and next year I win this tournament. So the next year I would be like second. And then, okay, next year I'm going to win this. And just like that, like, I will, next year I will do that. Next year I will do, I will do better. I will do better. It took me to this journey in the chess world. Just wanting more, just wanting to beat them. Um, uh, so that took me until international master level. <laughs> and you, you were you were about 18 years old when you got international master, and then a year later, you were a grandmaster. Were you one of the yes. youngest grandmasters in Armenia? Uh, one of the youngest, and that time it was also one of the youngest in the world, because that time 19 was 19 uh, grandmaster, it was really young. Now it's like if you are 19 years grandmaster, it's yeah, young, okay, but that time it was good. So I met... I made master at 18. At 19, I, I, I became a grandmaster. I, I had a strong wife at the time. My sister wanted to continue my father's uh, path and become a doctor too. Uh, but to become a doctor in Armenia, it's quite expensive. And I somehow I realized that I, I, I can support my family if I become a grandmaster. So I had just one year to make that. And all my minions in my head was with me. Like just, you, you once told me, I mean, to get a grandmaster, you have to go out and beat other grandmasters, and you have to travel in in to international tournaments. And you told you 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 once told me you you basically forced your mind like to have fighting spirit, so that the three times you left the country, you were able to get what's called grandmaster norms, which became which you you made, you know, that's how you become a grandmaster. And this is what I don't understand: how do you tell yourself? to have fighting spirit. And again, this applies to chess, 
poker, maybe business, investing, whatever. How do you, I can't seem to tell myself, okay, James, now's the time where you need fighting spirit. Yeah, so how it happens that I, I made GM in, in that three times in a row, beating grandmasters kind of, yeah. Usually how power people do, they play about 12 tournaments when they are master level, and in three they perform very well and they make three GM nerves. But I couldn't play 12 tournaments. Uh, I still couldn't afford that. I couldn't afford to travel all the time. So I had that, that if I play a tournament, I have to win. That's my chance. I will not have the second chance. And when you tell the minions in your mind, there is no second chance. It's now. All the minions come with you. There are no minion who doesn't come with you. If, there, if they know that there is a second chance, somebody will say, oh, let me lie there and this is coconut tree next time. But when you say, like, minions, look carefully. My sister, our sister is going to be a doctor and we need to become a grandmaster. We are going to train every morning, every evening. We wake up early. They are like, yeah, no problem, boss. And then when you go to the tournament, guys, listen to me carefully. We need to do our best here. All the minions are with you. So this, uh, ju just that way I made the, the three norms. Uh, one, I was lucky because one was in Armenia. It was a junior world championship. So that one I didn't pay for travels. I just played in, in my country and I, and, I, and I made my first Grandmaster norm. For two other tournaments, I traveled. For the second tournament, I was lucky because I not only made the Grandmaster norm, but I won a prize. So with that prize, I could afford the third tournament. And in the third tournament, again, I didn't have second chance. If, 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 if I didn't make, I, I would need to, to wait another one year to save money to go for a tournament. And then on the third tournament, again, minions, this is our chance. We make this, we, won, we win this, we make a Grandmaster Norm. Okay, one week you, you take a rest. You drink all you want, you have fun all you want, but just this tournament, just 10 days, no other thoughts, nothing. Just we focus on winning this. After that, you do whatever you want. Every minion says, yes, let's do that. And they are with me and doing that. And do you think that, like, I'm just trying to think, like, how would, let's say, let's say you start the, the tournament and you lose the first game. How would the fighting spirit, like, kick in? Like, how would you start to play better with the fear that, oh, maybe this tournament's not going to work out? Because now you have this fear that this might not work out. So f fighting spirit, maybe we can, we, can, we can refer to how many minions are there with you. Mm -hmm. Because if if you are if you are doing anything and not all the minions are with you, probably your you we can say it like fighting spirit, but actually it's like part of your minions, part of your army are not with you. They didn't understand why they should fight. They didn't understand why like they they need to put all their efforts instead of just chilling there. So I would talk to them, explain them very very detail like why we need to do it, and then all of it would 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 be with me. And if I lose the first game, it would be like, okay, we lost the first game. Why did this happen? Because that, 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 that. Okay, we removed the previous moves, whatever happened. We don't have that past. We took all the, all the glasses from the past. We focus on the next game. Why? Because we need to make a Grandmaster Norm. Right, minions, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and then we go to the game. Let, let's, say, let's say you're playing someone who is like, definitely better than you like let's say they were much higher rated and they already they were already like you know super grandmaster would you be able to convince yourself like hey i have just as much possibility to beat this person as anybody like would would you know would you be able to do you know upset the better players uh, i always had had in my mind that everyone are humans everyone are mistakeable myself i did ridiculous mistakes that when all the minions were like somewhere not with me, I would do ridiculous mistakes. So if ever, any of us are human, we can make mistakes. Nobody is perfect. So theoretically, there is a chance. What I can do, what I can do is this. Uh, I can perform 20% of my capabilities, 50%, 49, and 80, or close to 100. So my goal would be, okay, if my rating is 2400, it's not my actual level. It's the average of my best and when I am low. Hmm. So what if I hack this code? What if I hack and I always perform best? And this is how I would convince my minions, like, guys, 
he is great. Okay, but what if he perform our best? If even he will celebrate it, they were like, wow, we we, we bet that strong guy. If it was, they will be okay. If we perform our best, I would yell at them. I would just bring all the minions and just say, I'd yell at them if I didn't perform my best. If I did stupid things the last night. If I didn't focus before the game or during the game or I would go and uh, stare to a beautiful girl. I would yell all, at all these minions. But if we did all, we all together, we did our best. Okay. Somebody was better than us. Good. We took, we took a lesson. Good. There is, there is a place where we can become better. It's funny about the staring at a beautiful woman. Like I was reading this one grandmaster, uh, Alexander Shabalov in the, in the U S uh, formerly from Latvia. He was saying in an interview that maybe up to 50% of his thoughts during a game are about women. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's tough, especially if there is a there is an attractive woman playing in the tournament. It's it's tough. Um, but yeah, you can have this self-talk with your minions. And if you have strong why, you convince them that, okay, let's win this tournament and we get, go back to our country. We will have a bunch of opportunities to stare at, at the attractive girls. <laughs> and, you know, so okay, so you so you're you you got international master at 19. Did you think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be world champion? Like this is gonna be great. Like what what were your thoughts then professionally? Because like for for many, they when they achieve their goal, it's hard to sometimes find more motivation. Right. So most of the kids, if you talk to them who who try and trust, if you ask what's your goal, there would be one answer. Become a world champion. Uh and then often they get disappointed when the competition become, becomes tough. Uh, with my father, uh, he was smart. And from my childhood, together with my father, we had another, we had another goal. It was to represent uh, our country in Olympics. So to play in the national team, that was the goal. So to be in the top five in the country, that was my goal. Mm. And... Eventually, I made it uh, at 2010 when I became the champion of my country. Um, I, I, I don't know what happened then, then, but after the second round, I felt I'm going to win this. And despite I was not top seed at all, there was 10 players and I was number eight in the initial rankings. But somehow I knew I'm going to win this. Some, somehow my inner, like everything was telling I'm going to win this. And I told my father, father, if I, if I win this, it's his dream, right? If I win this, what you will do? He said, anything you want. And I was like, will you stop smoking? He said, yes. Okay, let's, okay, good. We shake each other's hand. And then I called to my friend who was not living in Armenia. Like, if I win this, what you will do? He said, whatever you want. Will you come to Armenia? He said, yes. And then, okay, <laughs> guys, you didn't understand what you just say, yes. And then eventually I really like very badly won the tournament. Uh, I made my father's dream. I became my country's champion. I, I played in Olympics. Um, but lucky me, I never had that ambition to become a world champion. I understood what are the sacrifices I'm going to make. And I was not ready for that. Wait, so I, I, was, I, was I was loving my life so much. I was so excited about different things in the life. I was never going to sacrifice everything for trying to become a world champion. And I'm like, okay, if I become a champion, what? <laughs> and what? Like, what, how I'm going to be happier? I never found an answer. So why the heck I should sacrifice everything to try to become a world champion where you go against all the odds because there are lots of talented people are fighting for that. And to, to just put in risk all my happiness for trying to become a world champion and that everyone will just applaud me and like, oh, he's a world champion. Okay, nobody applauds me and I don't care. I'm so happy. So, so, but that's really interesting. An interesting technique though of calling a variety of people and saying, if I achieve this difficult goal, you know, what would you do? And so your dad gave up smoking, your friend visited Armenia. Like this seems like, a useful technique plus the minions technique. But a lot of this is about mindset. Like obviously you were training in chess and studying chess and memorizing, you know, working with a, a trainer. What percentage of performance in an event, and again, we could be talking about chess, but it could be anything. 
what what percentage of performance do you think is skill versus mindset? When I was playing, I realized the power of mindset, despite I was using a few tricks without understanding. When I was playing chess and I got to my peak, becoming close to top 100 in the world, I never realized what is the power of mindset. I never, ever realized that. The day I realized that, the power of mindset, it was way after retiring from chess. I was living in Thailand, and during one event, I met very successful entrepreneurs. I was just blown away how young were they, how smart they were, and what they are doing. And they were blown away that I am chess grandmaster. <laughs> So they, and they were chess lovers and they eventually uh, offered me this deal. Like you teach me chess, we teach you business. And I like, yes, of course, let's go. And the first book they gave me, it was nothing about business. And I was like, huh? okay, the first chapter, second chapter, where, where is the business part? How to do business? Fourth chapter. Okay. No, this was not about business. And then second book. No, it's not about business as well. I just got so angry and I was, I went to them and like, where is my business book? Just tell me how to do this thing. What are you giving me to read? They're just like, okay, read this third one. And eventually I understood what they tried to do with me. There was lots of wrong beliefs in me. There was lots of things that would stop on my way. And they were just super smart. Advised me at first to start with mindset. So they just crushed many bad beliefs in me. Because one of the beliefs I had, it was like, rich is bad. Unconsciously, I had that thing. Because I was raised that way. Okay, rich people, just Robin Hood style, yeah? Rich people are, are stole something from the people. They did something uh, not honest and so on. So in my mind, there was this picture that rich people is not good. And it was in unconscious. I didn't understand this because myself, I wanted to become an entrepreneur, right? But they, they saw it. They were smart. They saw it. So they broke. They tried to broke everything. I was lucky that I understood and continued the journey of investing in learning about mindset. And after years, when I understood, I look back to my career, chess career, and I look to my tournaments. I'm like, wow, here I played this, 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 so good, so good, so good, because I was in, I was in that mood. I was, this was happening in my life. This was happening. I was so much determined to do that, that, and I performed well. And then I would look to my worst tournament and like, yeah, I was going to, to, to a tough period of my life. Uh, there was a year where I was performing as badly as possible. None of minions was with me because at that time my parents was going through divorce. And that is big thing in our culture. It was very hurting me because family for, for, was for me one of the top values. So I looked at it like, yeah, so this mood is so important. Mindset is so important. And then I started to invest and invest in more about learning and mindset. And coming back to the question, uh, mindset versus skills versus skills. I think mindset is almost everything because with wrong mindset, you even don't study right. You don't understand your goals right. With wrong mindset, you do so many things wrongly. And with right mindset, you can accelerate, accelerate everything with 100x. And during the game, like skills, mindset, if you're already grandmaster level, I would say like really, I would say 50-50. Because with very cool mindset, with 100% focus, when you bring all 100% of your army minions to the, to the game, that's a huge thing. Most of the people, they bring half of the minions to the game. Maybe a little bit more than half. Imagine if they if they doubled the strength, like two more army with you. You know, it's it's interesting. Like, what what books did the businessman give you? Do you remember? Uh, it was a few, few. I remember. I don't remember the exact uh, order. Uh, one was what's name Napoleon? What? Oh, Napoleon Hill. Think and grow rich. Think and grow rich. There was science of getting rich, something. Oh, oh Wallace Waddles. Yeah, the science of getting rich. Yeah. Uh, then I started at some point Tony Robbins' book, Unlimited Power and Awaken the Giant Within You. Yeah. I read like Simon Sinek, Why, and so on. Yeah.
Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional, and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest. Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. It's interesting how a lot of these books that businessmen read, and I've read all of those books, there's actually nothing to do like you say, they have nothing to do about business. There's no tech, there's nothing like, okay, here's how you come up with ideas for business. Here's how you negotiate. It's a lot of it is about mindset. And why do you think, like when you were training for chess, you had a, you, you probably had a trainer or a coach. What did they, did they ever teach you about mindset or is it just no, like? No, nothing. Unfortunately, nothing I have learned about mindset. Only I learned after retiring and trying to to switch to business. This is when I learned about mindset. Unfortunately, I didn't learn. Do you think if you never, like you kind of naturally and instinctively knew, okay, I'm only going outside the country three times or two times. I need to have fighting spirit. So So you worked on your mindset just sort of instinctively. Do you think if you, you know, if you didn't have that, 
you think you would ever become a grandmaster or Armenian champion? Uh, I think it's hard to know, I guess. A, a, yeah, but anyone who is getting somewhere to the close to the top, uh, I think even if they don't know some of the tricks, they understand themselves. Like, I I would understand to even if I didn't know know these mindset things, uh, I would understand what is persistence. I would understand that I just need to go and go and go. Uh, such things I I, I understood. Because sometimes I find like if I'm in the middle of a game and I make a mistake, this is the this is the conversation that happens in my head. There I go again, <laughs> you know, goddamn loser. Like I'm just such a loser. <laughs> just made another. Of course I made a losing move here, and then now this game's a waste. Uh, anytime you have a bad discussion with yourself, you're actually talking badly with your minions who are kids. And they are offended very easily, and they are just leaving you and going to play ping pong with, with, with together. So yeah. it, it, it never was instructed to me. And each time I would do some stupid thing in chess, poker, or business, the first thing is like always to talk with with minions, and it's been like, okay, okay, kids, kids, come on. You know, it's it's interesting because like when I've had problems, like let's say the, the you know one time early on in my kids' lives, I went broke. I would never let them know that anything was wrong. So with there, I had a good mindset, you know, or I learned to have a good mindset. Like the only way I'm going to make money back is if I have optimism, if I have creativity, if I'm coming up with ideas, if I have focus. And I remember I did this because when I was a kid, my father went broke. And I remember being so scared that he went broke that I just swore to myself, I would never let my kids feel that kind of fear. Now they're going to have their own problems in life. And I wasn't trying to shield them from problems, but I remember thinking that fear was so real to me that like, you know, my parents were, were crying all the time. My dad had gone broke. They were losing their home. And I just remember thinking, you know, and it scared me because I was a kid. I didn't know what was going on. Were, were we dying? Were they going to die? Like, I didn't know what was happening. And I always swore I never was going to let my kids feel that. And it's a, and it's a, a good analogy to think of these minions in your head as as like kids that you're, yeah, you, you know, not that you're going to lie to them, but you kind of train yourself to be to find opportunities so that it's sincere when you're talk when you're talking to them. They don't they don't say because kids could could see through all the BS too. You don't want them to 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 see that you're you know afraid. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, other way to put maybe it's to to somehow manipulate these minions because they are kids they don't understand many things and if I let my minions uh, I would eat lots of cakes every day <laughs> um, I love cakes maybe I don't love but these minions love and I think that I love but these minions they love cakes I love sweet I would just eat lots of cakes I would not train why to go to the gym. Like minions are, would, would tell me, let's go to watch that movie. Let's go to do to ski. Come on, I think it's snowing. You bought a ski. Finally, it's snowing. Let's go to ski. Yeah. So it's it's my job to say like, kids, wait, wait, wait. Now we have something important. Let's do this. Let's finish this. After 10 days, we do this perfectly. After 10 days, we go to ski. Okay. So I need to talk to them. I need to manipulate them. Otherwise, they would I would they would let me to do every stupid thing in the world, <laughs> and it's not just the the rewards for the for the minions, but also then there's these external people like your father stopping smoking, your friend visiting Armenia. You would you, you you kind of that's another way to motivate, I guess, the minions is say, look, I want my father to start stop smoking. We all want my father to stop. Yeah, smoking. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, like minions, and, this is your grandfather. It's my father. It's your grandfather. Do you want him to smoke? They're like, no, no, no. He smokes. It's bad. So do you want him to smoke? Smoke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's win the tournament. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's interesting because whenever I, you know, I've had a lot of chess coaches and so on, and it is all about chess, but I've had a lot of business mentors and it's very rarely been about business. Like when I have a, I have a business partner right now, been my business partner for since 1999, so 24 years. And 95% of our conversations are about psychology. They're not yeah. about numbers. They're not about, 
oh, if we invest in this, well, you know, it, should we invest in this? Should we invest in that? It's all about like, okay, we have to have this conversation. This is what this person's like. We think about psychology. We pick each other up when things are down. Like, it's funny how in some areas you instinctively know, okay, I love this enough and it's, I'm passionate about this. So I'm going to, to, and, and I realize there's consequences. So I'm going to have the right mindset, but somehow with, I have to learn it in other fields like chess, for instance, or poker. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, I, I'm just beginner in business. So I'm very careful for, 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 for advising things. But if somebody ever asked me, give me, give me the, 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 first book to read about business. I want to start some startups or something. My first book I give them is Ryan Holiday's Ego is the Enemy. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think, I think it's, the, it's the first book anyone who wants to start business, they should read. Because many things we want to do, maybe it's not us, but our ego. Maybe it's traumas we had in childhood. Our ego is so hurted. We want to do things, but we don't understand why. So until we don't figure it out, that thing, and if we don't figure it out, we can do so many stupid mistakes in our lives because of our this ego thing that no matter what kind of books we read about marketing, sales, that, 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 at some point we can just ruin all our career, all our business because our ego wanted stupid thing. Yeah, or like um, shame, for instance. Like if you lose a game and everyone thought you were oh, this is Avatek, he's the smartest person, whatever. But then you lose a game, you might feel shame. Did you go through a period like that when you were younger? Like, let's say when you're in your teens and moving up? Unfortunately, yes. And Particularly with know. your father looking over your shoulder. No, you unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. And I didn't realize that it was not me who was shame. It was my ego shame. So people are often afraid to play against lawyer, lawyer rated players. Because if you win, nobody says, bravo, oh, wow, you win this, that's, that's lower, like weak player. Everyone like, of course you should win. But if you lose, they are like, oh, shame on you. So whenever there is like some happens, some bad thing to you, it's, I found that it's not really you. It's just your ego who, who, who feels bad. It's this, this is ego who always messes up with us. And, the, and just as Kobe, Kobe Bryant said brilliantly, I was watching his, uh, his podcast uh, in, in the car and he was asked how he deal with pressure. And he said, there is no such thing as pressure. There is only ego. That's so, that's so interesting. So, so in chess, you kind of understood this. And then, you know, later on, you know, perhaps during the, the poker years, you, you left, you, you retired from professional chess and which I want to get to in a little bit, but you became a, a chess coach. And I've seen many chess coaches at work and they've all been good. I've learned from every chess coach that I've had. I've probably had too many chess coaches, you know, ever since I was 18, the second I started playing, I got a coach because I kind of knew <laughs> to get good at something, you need a, a teacher and a, and a coach. But you are by far the best chess coach I've seen not just for me, but for so many people, like you've, you've uh, thank you. so many grandmasters and, and, and you've taken people from, I've introduced people to your website. I had an experience yesterday. So, you know, I have this, as you know, I have this plus minus equals theory where you get a coach. Um, you also exchange notes with your, your equals, and you also find people to teach because that helps you understand something. Well, about a month ago, uh, I gifted a, a membership of chessmood.com to one of my, one of my students, I have very few students, but one of my students, and he's literally, his rating has gone from 550, which is absolute beginner to over a thousand. So it's incredible. What, what, what is his written success story? <laughs> I know I'll, I'll, I'll get a testimonial for you. Cause I, I just learned yesterday that he's, cause the last time I saw him, which was two weeks earlier, he was around 750. So he was moving up. And then yesterday I, I meet him and he's like, guess what? I'm over a thousand. And so, and he wow. was stuck at wow. five bro. and he's showing me the Dutch attack and the French attack from, he's showing lines for me. Like, I don't know, is that the scotch? I don't know. And he's like, yeah, this is the move here. He's like 10 moves in. He's like, those all the moves. And, and he's asking me the mindset questions. Like, how do you avoid anxiety? Like, these were questions I never asked 
my coaches until, you know, I met you. And because everyone just focused on chess, which is fine. But you do focus, uh, like if people read your blog, you focus so much on like mindset and self-help. And you've read, you know, Ryan Holiday, Derek Sivers, like all these people. So I actually, I wrote to Ryan yesterday and told him you were coming on the podcast. I wanted to see oh. if he was- I wanted to see if he was around to see if he could come on, but he was, he was in the middle of, he does, he does another podcast, but he wrote me a story. Um, let me see. Uh, oh yeah. He told, he, he said, there's a story about Seneca who's uh, a famous stoic. Yeah. And Seneca was sentenced to death on his last day while he waited for the executioner. He was playing a chess like game. Maybe it was chess. Uh, in his prison cell, he was playing with a friend. And when the executioner came, Seneca got up and um, he said to his friend, let it show that I was a piece ahead, that the last thing I, in my life is I was a piece ahead on you. And then and then he marched off to be killed. So he had no complaints, no tears. The last thing he said was about chess and that he was a piece ahead. Wow, and, that's such, 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 such a strong, strong story and I never found it in his book, in his books. Yeah, new new story from him. Wow. So it's interesting, like the relationship between playing these super competitive games and stoicism and mindset, because I don't know why it is a game like chess as opposed to, I don't know, some other random game. I mean, poker is at this level too, but poker is more about money. Chess is somehow so competitive and so in the brain that you really feel it very deeply when you win or you lose and it's, and it's very painful when, when you lose and it's, you know, hopefully very happy when you win. And so it was interesting when I started reading your blog, so much of it is about mindset. Like you have the story of the guy in Armenia who was seated last place, but he was confident he was going to win. What was that story? Yeah. So this was a big lesson for me. Um, the, 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 the year I won Ar- Armenian Championship, the next year, so I need to keep my title, we were sitting, sitting in, in, in the room, all players, and there were like journalists. And they would ask us questions, who would win this year? Like, you know, this is not a good question, who would win you this year? You're 10 or around about the same level. A few are stronger, a few are a little bit weaker, but about the same level. So we would, we, we would give vague answers. Mm, like, you know... A- anyone who plays good, he will win. Anyone who is lucky, probably he will win. Uh, s- depends. We will see. And then they asked this guy who was the last seed. So he was uh, objectively at the time weakest in the tournament. And also with his rank- ranking, with his rating system, he-, he was the weakest. He was last seed. And when he- they asked him who will win, he was like, I will win. We all laughed like, ah, <laughs> we just laughed. And he came and won the tournament. He did. He came and won. And with, the, with this guy, actually, I trained for a year. When I was a kid, I don't know what he saw in me. I was much weaker than him. He asked me if, he, if I'm interested to, to, to train with him. He was a grandmaster at that time. I was not even an international master. And the grandmaster ask you to train with him, you are like, yeah, tomorrow, 3 a.m., what time I come? So I trained with him, and I, and I saw this character all the time. He was not so strong. But his belief, somehow, he was all the time believing that he will win. It always leading him to success. There is a funny story we have, always we laugh, and we have this who could believe sentence we all the time refer to each other, but this comes from one place. Uh, he plays against super grandmaster. He plays with black pieces. So with black pieces, you have disadvantage. But with black pieces against super grandmaster, he loses the game, and he's just walking around and talking to himself and says, who could believe I will lose this game? <laughs> he had such a strong belief all the time in himself that this was taking him to the peak he was always picking his performance. But, but you know, there's a fine balance because, you know, and I see this in entrepreneurship all the time. People come up with an idea and they think it's the best idea ever. And then I look at their idea and I'm like, huh, that is probably the worst idea I've ever seen. And 
but people have very strong self belief. But then they, it, but it's objectively not a good idea, and their business absolutely work out. Like so, there's a fine balance between having belief in yourself, but too much belief. Like if I go in to play Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, and I say, well, I'm confident in myself, I'm going to win. I'm never going to win. Or you know, I shouldn't say never, but I'm never going to win. And uh, how do you no. how do you balance that fine line between? This is a really tough part. I think I think to to stay objective, it's one of the toughest things in our lives we can we can we can do. Like it's very tough. Um, personally, in order not to jump out of my head, I always I always read stories, mainly with Ryan Holiday's book, to keep with me balanced. And all the time we are hearing all this type go, you can do that that that. So where is this balance? Like right, it's these tough questions. To stay objective, I have just one general good tip for myself. I find people who are smarter than me, who are ahead than me in life, who have done similar things than me, and I ask them. For example, uh, I had the goals of this year, where I will lead trust mode in one year. I will do that, 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 that. So it can be very optimistic and not objective, or it can I can be pessimistic, I could do much better. So where to find balance? And what I do? I ask my investors. Hey guys, you have done this for over years and years. This is the plan I have. What do you think? I ask my mentors, I can ask, hey James, like look look at this. I trust you as, as my mentor. What do you think about these numbers? Are they more or less accurate? And with this, I'm more or less coming close to that sweet, sweet spot. And when I said people who are ahead of you, who, who, who are there where you, you would try to get there, because they were always optimistic that they got there. So it will not be like golden like balance. It will be golden balance plus. So I call this in medium plus. Yeah. For example, you can you can reach new ten thousand students. Okay, so that's probably on average. 12,000, that is average plus. So always I put this for my team as well. What are we going to do this week? Plus. It's like you kind of have your team of experts who have seen this over and over again, like let's say business growth, and you say, where do you think if I were to perform at peak, where I would be? They might say, okay, 10,000 subscribers. And then you just, you add a little bit to that. So So this way you're not, you don't say to yourself a hundred thousand subscribers, which you might say if you were, you know, had too much uh, confidence or too much optimism, you kind of get the upper range. It's sort of like what you were saying before is that your ranking in chess or poker or whatever will be, is really just the average of your best performances, your worst performances, your medium performances and so on. But you know, with the right mindset, you'll be forming, you'll perform closer to the peak than the bad. So you find out what that peak is by asking objectively the experts, you add a little bit to it. Yes. And then you know, okay, given the knowledge I have, given the work I've already put in, this is what everybody thinks is the peak. So I know with the right mindset, I could come close to the peak because this is what the objective experts say. And then to in kind of inspire a little bit more, you add to that. So this is a good technique. But sometimes the tricky part is that sometimes you need to have guts, you need to have courage and say, no, I'm going to get to get higher. Because when I was 18 and I wanted, I was international master. I just made my international master. And usually it takes two, three, sometimes four years like to master for two grand masters, depends. In my case, when I didn't have super coaches, I didn't have finances, I didn't have to try, I, I couldn't afford to travel to play strong tournaments, play against strong people and improve. Like two years would be even like, wow. But I told like everyone, I, I want to make this in one year. And everyone I would ask this advice, they would like, like come back to the earth. No, 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 not one year. Like, come on, this is dangerous for you. You will break yourself now. Uh, that's a tricky part. That sometimes you need to say like, yeah, with all the respect to you, I think I, I think this time I'm right. But this you should be very, I think, accurate. You should be very careful with that and do just time to time. You cannot always do that. 
You can do that if, if each time you do and you are right, you are better than, the, than whatever they, they, they advised you then, you, then you need to find some kind of new mentors. But in my case, it was everyone would say no more than two years. And I said, no one year, no one year. So I would just ask a coach, like, hey, will you train me? I want to become a grandmaster. He would say, yeah, of course, but two years. I said, no, 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 thank you, goodbye. Uh, because I wanted to do in one year. I had to do, and I made it. And this is probably one of the things that it always stays with me. I always ask, ask, ask advice, but sometimes I come, I come, I come back with my gut and I'm like, no. I will do differently what, whatever they say, no matter how But maybe, they are maybe them. you saw many examples. And by the way, I should mention Armenia, which has like 3 million people, has something like 100 grandmasters, some like outrageous number of grandmasters, like more grandmasters than any other country practically. And you're smaller than the average city in the United States. Yes. And so, so you saw a lot of examples of people going from one level to another level. Maybe you knew, okay, I saw this person go from one level to the grandmaster level. And, but I felt like they didn't train hard enough or they trained this, but they didn't train that. So maybe you knew, okay, if I just train all of these things, I'm going to have a little bit of edge on speed, just mathematically over all these other people. Maybe I was like, they are not saying that one year I'm going to be able to wake up at 7 a.m. and train 10 hours a day. I felt like they don't believe in this. I don't believe this is possible, but I knew, I knew this is possible to do. If you want something very badly, you will do that. So I felt like they are underestimating what I can do. And this actually came from my childhood. My self-belief comes from, comes from the childhood. And I have this story which changed probably all my life. Uh, when I was 12, I was not working on chess at heart at all. I was very lazy because my minions wanted to play mm -hmm. video games. You know, you know, it's, I didn't have toys in my childhood. Now I am 12 years old. There are video games. I have some computers. There is Need for Speed 1 or 2. I don't remember what was it. It's bad graphics, but I wanted to play. So I would wake up at 6 a.m. I would tell my father, my, I'm, I'm training chess, but I would play video games before going to school. <laughs> and once he got me and he said, like, what are you doing? He was so angry at me. He said, no more chess. He punished me, and I didn't play chess for one year. So when you are 12, on like peak, like you are training, the, the, the one year is big things there. I didn't play chess for one year. He just said, no more chess. I cried, I'm like, please, please forgive me. That He did no chess, no more. He was very angry at me. I was bored, <laughs> and I went to, we had a martial art, some, MMA group in our school. So I signed up there. Okay, I'm going to be there. I was very skinny, you know, like, I wanted to be a little bit stronger. So I was like, okay, let's go to MMA. And my coach asked me this question, I went there, like, why did you come? And I said, you know, just, just become better. I don't have ambitions to become world champion, just to become stronger. He didn't want such students. He wanted champions who will do marketing for him. And he, did, he wanted to get rid of me and said, okay, hmm, let's, let's see what you can do, how you can fight. I was 12 and he put me in front of a 15 years old kid who was training already a few years there. And I have never beaten in my life like that. <laughs> I couldn't stay on my legs for a few seconds. They would bam, bam, and like I was in, on the floor. I would wake up. I was chess player, you know, fighting. So I would wake up and again, two seconds, I am on the floor. He beat me very badly. Everyone laughed at me very badly. And he's like, okay, just go take rest. Okay, we saw how you fight. Everyone was still laughing at me. And that moment I had a choice. To leave and go home and never come back to martial arts or to say to myself, let's beat this guy. I had a choice. And probably this is the best choice I've ever made in my life. Because I think if I, if I did another choice, I would never be where I am now. So I made this commitment to myself. I'm going to beat this guy next year. No matter he's three years older than me, I'm going to beat this guy next year. And the next morning, I wake up at 6 a.m. But instead of playing video games, I ran to the park 
to jog, to train, to do push-ups, to do things. And then the next day I showed up to the class and coach was like, oh, you came up. I was, my, my, my eyes was blue. There was uh, blood, blood in my eyes. I just showed up to the lesson. Uh, some of the older, older uh, students, uh, they probably appreciated that. Uh, they got some sympathy to me. And after the lessons, I would stay there. I would stay there. Some would come and show me a few more tricks. Some of them would teach me a few things. I would train. I would try to outwork. I would try to outtrain. Um, and just like that, every morning I wake up at six before going to school. I trained, and then school, then then go there every day. I would do push-ups to beat the other this, guy. This is a great example, by the way, well, of doing one percent more per day than the competitors. You're going to improve so much thirty-eight times faster in one year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely like that. He, he would just finish the tournament, he, he would finish that lesson and go to the uh, shower shower room. I would, stick, I would stay and train. And, I, and he didn't know that I was training at 6 a.m. as well. So even, eventually I got, I got the chance. I got the chance. We had a bad fight. Uh, long story short, I broke his, his hand uh, during the fight. Uh, I won him, but it was not a win I wanted because I broke his hand. And I ran from there, and I never came back to MMA. After one year, I came back to my father and said, Father, I'm missing about chess, please. I will never do that again. I'm missing about chess. Please let me back to the chess. My father agreed. And probably if I didn't have that experience in MMA, every morning waking up at 6 a.m., training, trying to be better every day, keeping consistency, I would never get that lesson that I would need in chess because that gave me such a big lesson for my life in chess, in poker, in business, everywhere. So just do think, do think every day. Just keep the discipline, as Ryan would say. Keep going, become better. One day you will Again, arrive. Again, we're quoting Ryan a lot, but his stuff's great. You finally got to this point where you showed respect for chess as opposed to playing video games when you were, uh, uh, you know, should have been studying. You knew that you needed to show respect for the game in order to improve and more respect than the other people, your competitors were showing. But, but no, let me ask absolutely. you this though. Uh, everybody says, oh, it's about the process, not the goal. But you would set for yourself goals. I'm going to become a grandmaster. I'm going to beat this kid in chess. I'm going to make money at poker. You would set goals and of course, respect the process. So, you know, what do you, it seems like it, goal setting is very important. Yeah, I, I put goals so my minions know where we are going. Otherwise, like, okay, we train every day, where, where we are going. I cannot explain the minions, like, uh, believe in process, uh, just keep going, focus on growth. I can't, they are kids, minions are kids. So they need to have gold. And when they know, okay, we are going to beat that guy because he beat us very badly. Yeah, they are waking up with me every day at 6 a.m. So for me, goals are mainly to... Explain with these kids, these minions in my head, where we are going. So they are every day show up with me at 6 a.m. Uh, or 5 a.m. whenever I wake up. This, this is where I, where I need goals. But uh, because I'm a bit smarter than the kids, I'm trying to focus on the growth. And every day, this is, this is one thing I have, every day to do best I can do. Just the best, absolutely my best. This is where I'm focusing. I'm not focusing on the goals, on numbers or anything, just the best, absolutely every best I can do. And it comes not just like whatever, like business, chess or what's that, in relationship. I'm going to have, I'm going to meet my friend. I'm going to do my best to bring with all my best energy. I'm going to, to meet my family, to my father, my mother, my sister. I'm taking my love from my heart and I'm going to put it there. I'm going to train, I'm going to go to gym, I'm going to do my best. I'm always like during the gym, I always take, I always keep my in my brain, Kobe's brand words, whose teacher say that, take rest at the end, not in the middle. So during the gym, I'm like, okay, my best is do this. It's like my, my, my minions are like, we are tired. I'm like, no, 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 no. 50 seconds, we took rest, let's go to the next rap. And we do that. So whatever I do, this is one thing I have. I always do my best. And I satisfy my minions with like, this is the goal we have. This is where we are going. So I keep them excited. 
And I know that the, the winning way is to focus on process. And so when you switched from chess to poker, first off, obviously a lot of chess players get attracted to poker because sometimes it's hard to make money at chess, but poker, they see a game and they love, chess players love games. They see a game where you can make a lot of money. And so what, what did you bring from you, with you from the chess experience um, into the poker world? Uh, well, probably the work ethic first. I, I understood that first part, I, I wanted to play poker because I love that game. And second, I understood that people are not understanding that it's a very complex yeah. game. They think it's luck, but it's not luck. Most of the people don't understand that. So there are lots of opportunities going to be there. Uh, and the first thing I brought with me, it was a work ethic. So w when I retired from trust, I had some savings. And with that savings, I could live one year. And in one year, I, I had to beat in poker game. One year is not, is not as long as it seems. So I brought that work ethic with me, with every day, waking up and training. I brought with me some knowledge with me because during the during chess career, I understood that you need to have good guidance. It can be a coach, it can be a book, whatever there is. There are mass of information. There is chaos of information. First thing you do, don't jump to the first book you see. Don't jump to the first coach you see. Do the research carefully and pick the best you can. This is going to be very important for you because the direction you, you will take it will take with you for a year. So spend at least some time to do to, to research and figure out your, your direction. So I did my research, I found my books, I found some courses, I found some people whom I would follow. I would keep going. Already that time I had from the from chess my improvement uh, method, which I use in everywhere. Uh, study, practice, fix. So you study, you practice because with practice, you really learn what you have studied and you fix the mistakes. Otherwise, you will repeat it again. And then you do it over and over again. Study, practice, fix, study, practice, fix. So I would do that in poker. Study, practice, fix, study, practice, fix. I had, you know, at, at one point in my room that was, there was all printed some uh, poker things. I would print and stick to my walls some things to remember, some calculations, some, some graphs, some charts. All my room was poker. And every day I was in poker, like one year. And eventually at, at one point, my, my parents were against this poker. And it's very understandable, you know. Their son is grandmaster. Their son is Armenian champion. They are so proud of him among their friends, among our relatives. Their, their son is grandmaster, you know, it's proud, yeah? And now he skips chess. He, he stops playing chess. Oh, what? He grandmaster and he stops chess? What? And what he's going to do? He will play poker. Like a gambler. The best he's probably he gambling to and drinking. Gambler, yeah. Especially in Armenia. Especially in Armenia. Like if you say it to other countries, like, oh, you're a poker player. Oh, you are smart. In our country, it was like, oh, you're a gambler, you're going to play in casinos, like, what is that? So from chess grandmaster switching to poker, it was very bad. So each time I would play poker and my, my parents would come, I would just minimize my, my poker stars and I would lose money until yeah. they leave the room. And at one point, I figured out, okay, I can win already. It's time I can win. But something I'm missing, and I'm missing that I can just sit, nobody distracts me, nobody enters to my room, and I can do that. And I put myself in a bad situation. I went and I rented the place. I, the first time ever, it was my dream to live alone at some point, to have a jacuzzi, where at, at the end of the day, I just lay there, I drink Armenian brandy that Charlie loved so much, or, uh, or homemade wine. And in jacuzzi, proud of myself. So I finally rented, rented my place. But there was a trick. I had just one month payment. <laughs> and in poker, it's not like, okay, you have standard, like usually your salary, you are, going to, you are going to pay it anyway. You are playing poker. You can win, you can lose, or it can be bad month, good month. But there was a pressure. There was a pressure on me. I had just one month. And if I do it well, dear minions, we are going to get our dream. You remember you wanted to be in jacuzzi 
every night at the end of the day, drink something and relaxing alone. Minions, yeah. So listen to me carefully, minions. This month is going to be the most important month. There is no time to tilting when we play. And there is no time to thinking about other things. There is no time with dating your beautiful girls. No, nothing. No. We are going to eat cakes. No. We are going to have to do our absolute best. We need to perform our best, okay? Then you will have your jacuzzi and everything. They're like, yeah. And I won very big that month. I won so big, I had many months in upcoming months to pay the bills. And then me and yeah, we go jacuzzi. So this this is this is uh, how I how how I made but, it. But also at this point, I mean, you uh, must have known all the whatever is game optimal theory and. Uh... No, I I trained I trained one year about ten hours a day, about ten at least ten hours a day, and one year that that period switching from chess grandmaster to poker player, I just locked myself in my room, no parties. Almost no birthdays, no beers, no Friday nights, nothing. I just limited myself and I say, one year we are going to our dream, to our free life. And we're going to do what we love. We love this game. We're going to be free. With this, we can just live in any country we want. Actually, this is eventually I did, right? It just poker, I moved to Thailand. But that was my dream. I'm going to live alone, do whatever I want. Okay, you're playing this game that I'm very interested in. So, okay, what's the price? I think everything has a price. Whenever you want something big, there is a price. So, okay, the price is going to be no more these parties and everything. Okay, that's the price. Like, I'm wondering if also what you brought from chess to poker, obviously the mindset, the work ethic, but, you know, there's this notion of the 80-20 rule. So 20% of the work, you have to figure out what 20% of the work creates 80% of the value. So what do you think, what was the 20% of work in poker that created 80% of your skill? Unfortunately, I didn't know that 80-20 rule, part rule that time. <laughs> so I was messing around. I was doing all kinds of things. But if you had to tell someone now? The research, what you are going to learn, from where you are going to learn, whom you are going to follow. I think that's the, that's the not like 199. So it's not necessarily memorizing all the statistics of each hand. It's how you're going to learn how to play. You, you, can, you can learn from so many wrong sources. And unfortunately now, when there are so many websites created for, for people to make money, to, so any beginner can teach things. You go to Udemy, every beginner teaches things, and then you look, oh, they made already, they have 100,000 students, and look their, their profiles, they are, like, they, they are not expert yeah. even. Uh, and the same was happening in poker, and I think it's happening in everywhere. Whatever you, wherever you go, almost everywhere, there are like mass of people who are teaching and making money. So what you want? You want to, to make some help money, or or you want to find experts who did that and they genuinely want to help you to improve the game. I think this is something a very very important thing. Uh, the same the same way I now I try to learn about marketing, branding, or whatever. Yeah. The first thing I I spent lots of time on researching from where, which source, whom, which book I am going to learn. I never take a book and okay, let's start let's start this start this book. Okay, this has interesting intro. It has interesting description. Oh, what is the description? It's written by copywriter to make sales. So like I've spent lots of time before taking my book. Because I'm going to spend like lots of hours to read my book. My book. I'm going to spend lots of hours to read, to spend a 20-hour course. So where I'm going to spend? So this research to me is not 80-20. It's maybe 199. So wherever I, this is my advice to myself and to my very close people, I'm very capable of giving public advice because I'm still beginner there. I can give advice in in, in chess. Okay, I'm expert there, but in this business, in this, I'm still beginner. I'm very careful. But this is. What it took me to, 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 it took me and it continues taking me. I'm doing very careful research before taking something and investing my time. And I guess knowing this, like, so, you know, after poker, you became like this incredible chess coach and you created this. One of the distinguishing features of chessmood.com is that only top grandmasters have, you know, pick 
all the content of the site. So nobody less than like the highest level picks all the content on the site. And that makes a huge difference. Like, what would you say is the difference? And again, people who don't know the the ranking system, there's there's like world champions like Magnus Carlsen. There's then super grandmasters who are like, let's say the top 10 in the world. There's grandmasters, there's international masters, there's something called a FIDE master, there's national masters. So there's all these level of master. What would you say is the difference between a grandmaster and like an international master? Uh, it seems just one level, but there are much, much, much more international masters than grand masters. It's the half level to cross because from international masters to cross to grand master, there is a very tough competition. You can become an international master, just work from your childhood five hours a day and you get to international master. From international to master to grand master, that's very, very huge difference. And often it's not just skills, often it will be mindset things. Some grand masters realize it unconsciously, just like me. I realized a few tricks. I could do it much earlier if I knew what I know now. Uh, but it's that for to, when you're a grandmaster, you not you don't know just chess. You know lots of more things about mindset, how to focus during the game, how to come how to come back after painful defeats, and other things. It's not just chess. Yeah, like I see, um, you know, there's a lot of YouTubers, and there's YouTubers who are grandmasters, YouTubers who are international masters. And one thing I see among a lot of the international masters is they play in a tournament. And if they have a bad tournament, they quit chess. <laughs> and, you know, obviously the grandmaster doesn't quit chess and keeps on going. And so it seems like dealing with disappointment. And by the way, this is true for business too. Like most businesses don't work out. And so you have to have an ability to either pivot or start the next business when one business fails. You can't be so disappointed that, okay, now I'm going to just be, you know, a janitor at, at at a restaurant or something like you have to not that there's anything wrong with that but you have to be able to push through the disappointment and that's very hard i was i was training i was practicing kung fu at one point and we had this grade levels one level two level three level and until six six is like grand master super grand master and there was something interesting you get to first level in two months you get to the second level in in another two months so in four months, you get to the second level. But from second level to the third level, you go in about two years. Mm. And many would just drop from two to three, many. So I asked my coach, why did you make this way? And he said, look, this is a wall that will separate people who want it and really want it. We made the first two levels easy. So at least we will introduce them what is this Kung Fu, what is this Wing Chun. We will introduce them some good things. So they will, they will, they will need this, this knowledge. But then it comes the wall. You either stop right there. It's like two years to train to get three. And like it's, you do over and over the same thing. It's become boring, not interesting. So you want it so much or you're like, okay. So if you're like, okay, you drop it out. And the same way, when you play chess, I think there will be lots of walls. You will have very painful defeats. Everyone has. Everyone. I had a defeat. I was 17. I was quite older. I could not kid anymore. But I, I cried like a baby. I cried like a baby. I was so angry. I was breaking the breaking everything. I, I could see when I when I left the playing call, just going and breaking everything I, I could see. And I didn't touch chess for one month. And just like that, many just stop chess or whatever they do. Uh, I came back to chess. So that was a wall for me. I would either stop, I would either go. And just it's, it's most, of, most of the kids, they drop somewhere when they are like very young. They had one bad tournament, they, they, they quit. There will be always walls. And where does that persistence come from? Like, like, is that something that you just had in you because let's say you love chess or you love poker or you love Kung Fu or whatever it is so much, or is it something that, you know, you, you teach yourself also like what, how much of that is 
skill versus built in? Most of the time, as I said, I think you should manipulate the kids, minions in your brain. But sometimes they can help you. Sometimes you will be down and these kids will come and say, Father, wake up. Come on, Father. Hmm. So in my case, I manipulated that kids, that minions, so badly. We are going to crush this and we are going to become a grandmaster. That when, this, when, I, when it, I hit that wall, I break down, I fall down. These old minions were also very sad. But then turns out and woke, woke up and say, guys, our father is weak. Let, let's wake him up. Another 20,000, 40,000, 100,000, 1 million. And they're like, hey, Avatik, wake up. Come on, father, we can do that, you know? And now your kids are taking you, taking from your shoulder and like, come on, wake up. We can do that. Like, yes, let's do it. Let's, con- let's continue our journey. And, and what do you think is the difference between, let's take Magnus Carlsen and the other top 20 players in the world. So yes, sometimes he loses to them, but he's clearly, I think everyone would agree. And even if you don't know chess, you could relate to this in whatever field. The number one player in this, in the case of chess is Magnus is head over heels above the next 19 in the top 20. I don't want to say he, he could crush them every time, but sometimes he goes years without losing a game. You know, now maybe he's a little older, he loses a little bit more games to the younger people, but he still beats them overall, wins the world championship. He's the world blitz, rapid, and 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 overall champion. So what's the difference between him and number five, number 10? I don't know the answer. <laughs> I can only guess. I I retired quite early and I didn't and enough time with the top players, which I could, I would have chance if I continued my journey. But this is what my guess is. Um, everyone has different brains. Yeah, you train, you train, but you, sometimes some people have different brains. Some people are just different IQ. Dif- their brain works differently. Another thing I guess is that it's level of sacrifices. I know Aronian. Aronian is uh, Armenian grandmaster who was at some point number two in the world, and there was just a 10-point rating difference between Carlson and him, and it was not very clear that Carlson is better than him. I knew Ar- Aronian, so this is something I can tell. Aronian loves life. He knows about so many things. He had so many interest- interests. He would go to these museums, he would go to these concerts, he, knew he would go, he know all the jazz players, he know all the stuff. He has so many interests. So one, one thing I'm guessing is the level of sacrifice. One thing I'm guessing is the, is, the, is the brain level. And one thing is just your talk with your, with, your, with your minions. How you manipulate them, how you convince them, how you persuade them to be with you all the time. I mean, that's at, at the highest, highest level. So where does talent take you? So obviously, Aronian... Um, who was number two in the world, but yet he was able to enjoy many other areas of life. Obviously, he had enormous talent um, to be able to get to that level and not make perhaps as many sacrifices. Do you think talent always forces a player to have a plateau? Like, where could your talent have taken you if you had not retired from chess? How how many years ago was it you retired from chess to switch to poker and then coaching? I retired in 2014. So nine years ago. If these past nine years, you had been studying chess 10 hours a day. Where do you think your talent could have taken you? In top 20. Right, because you were already like, let's say 50 rating points from the top 20. You know, let's say you were in the 2600s. You took the no, 20, like 150 no. points, 150 points. But still, I, I think, I, think I, w- I would get to t- top 20, but not in top five. And what's the difference between the top five and, and you? I think the tal- this talent which people are calling often, it's not just what is given by you from the universe or from your genes, yeah? Yeah, there is part how your brain works. Yeah. It comes from like how you are born, okay? Someone's brain is better than another's. But also I, I am firmly believer in this foundation thing. If the first floor is weak, you, can, you cannot make a 50 floor building, you can make maybe 12. So I think that often it comes to foundation. 
just what you have done when you were a child. Because it's just chess, yeah? How you looked at this game, from which angle, how you understood this game, what you have done in your first one year. What are the openings maybe you played? Like, what foundation did you put? Just, just the same way when I was in Thailand and that guys were teaching me about business, they taught me mindset. My foundation was very weak in order to start, to start mindset. I couldn't make mindset. I, sorry, I couldn't make business with that mindset I had. I had very weak mindset. I had huge ego and other things. So they helped me to just break everything I have and then build a new foundation. And then I continued my foundation. And I still... so, so it's not just as a child, you're able to, if with the right persistence, you're able to rebuild your, your foundation. Uh, yeah, often some people are getting lucky with their, like first coach, who is your first coach is very important. People are often thinking, okay, like I'll just take, take the school and then I'll take the better coaches. But I think that the first, first teacher is super important, mm -hmm. how they will build that foundation, because then it's tougher, tougher to just break everything and rebuild, rebuild it again. Uh, why I said I would, I would get to 20 to, to 20. I think my foundation was not so bad, but it was it was not perfect. And with talent, clearly I cannot say I didn't have talent because I, I won my grandmother at four years old. But it I didn't have that talent. My my memory comparing to, to grandmaster level was very weak. Uh I we could say that I was uh less talented than than hundred top hundred players, but I would outwork them everyone. Mm. I would talk to my minions and this way I would compensate that I'm less talented than, than them and I would get to top 20, but still I would need that foundation and brain to get to top five. And, and I didn't want that. I didn't want to sacrifice all my life to get into top 20 and then to get to the top five. And even if I get to the world champion, okay, I'm world champion and what? When I am in the rope weight going to ski and I'm sitting there or I'm taking a shower, nobody knows that I'm world champion. Only me knows. So this is what I was carrying all my life. That when I'm, whenever I'm alone, when I'm, I'm laying in my jacuzzi, I'm happy. Not when I'm in front of the people they know, oh, this is a world champion. Oh, this is a billionaire. Oh, this is a famous people. Like I didn't care, never. All I wanted is when I'm alone, when I'm in toilet or in bathroom or wherever I am in the, in, in on my bike or my motorbike, I'm happy. This is where I will be with me and with my million, million kids, my minions. And I mean, it, I feel like this is related to you switching ultimately to coaching and becoming, you know, I would say again, from my limited experience and I've in my own areas, whether it's business or investing or writing, I've been a coach or a teacher or whatever, I would say you're like a top 20 coach in chess. I mean, I don't know many coaches that have, you know, put in the work and had the success that you've had as a coach. And, you know, and, and by success, I can measure it by seeing how many people you took from, let's say, master to grandmaster or 500 to a thousand or what, or, and also the, the work I see you put into the, your website, chessmood.com. What, when you're looking at other students, are you looking for, the, what are you looking for at first? Are you looking for the, what's the 20 that can create 80% of the value? What do you look for when you're, when you're beginning to work with a student? And this could help, again, anybody who is mentoring anybody or teaching anybody. Well, f f first of all, I always try to become a better coach just like that. I try to become a better grandmaster, a like better chess player or better poker player. Uh, just the same way I did with my, my chess coaching, I understood that there, there should be work. And that work was, nobody see, nobody saw. I would now train my some students to become better at calculation, but they never saw my hours and hours of research or finding examples. And the same way my hours of hours when I read books or I spend with my high performance coaches to learning things that I will teach to my students. So this is something I always spent. And if I, if I had this ego, Maybe I would say, no, 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 wait, 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 James, I'm, I'm not top, in top 20, I'm top one. But uh, Ryan helped me. Ryan helped me. You see that book there? Yeah. He helped me. And one of my, my uh, goals of this year, my, my, my to -do in my to-do list, is to travel the world and meet the people who I think is better coaches than me 
and I can learn from them to become a better coach. So this is something that's, that's why I say like always, Ego is the Enemy is the first book I, re I recommend everyone who, go, who want to go somewhere. And coming back to your question, uh, what I'm looking for for my students is to make them happier people through trust. I don't want to make them become a miserable grandmaster. And do, do you know a lot of miserable grandmasters? Yes, very unfortunately. I remember I was living, uh, I was sharing the room uh, during one of the tournaments with a grandmaster who was in the top 50. And he lost the game. And he came back very angry on himself. And I was like, come on, it's just one game. Why you are so angry? Let's go to drink something. Like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, what I don't understand? Like, look, I live in Paris. I have that apartment. I need to pay that bill. Ta, 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 ta. And he showed me that he has prepared 12 tournaments to play that year. And many of them, not just to become better, but just to win some money, so to cover the salaries and so on. So it's not my guess. Unfortunately, many, many top players, they hate their life, but they can't find that courage to leave everything, to stop everything, and start something from absolutely scratch. This is not easy. I haven't read yet Ryan Holiday's Courage book. I'm going to read it. Maybe it will help them. But it, it's not easy. The same way I remember it was 2014. I was in Indonesia. I was a grandmaster. I was playing. I was starting to hate my life already. Everything I had in my life, I, I, was, not, I was not happy. The, my chest life, it was stopped. I, my, my parents were going through divorce. I was not happy. I was playing badly. I was not happy with the relations I had with my girlfriend. I had friends, but I felt like they are taking lots of advantages and they are sometimes envy on things. I hated many things. And that day, I lost to a woman grandmaster from Germany very badly. He, she won me like a kid. I came back to the room very miserable and I said, I'm going to change all my life. Absolutely everything from one to hundred, everything I will change. I stopped playing chess. I came and broke with my girlfriend. I called to some of that. I don't want to call them friends. And I said, no more. Don't call me again. You're not friends. But you did that, that, that. No, you're not friends. I changed all my life and I switched to poker. That's a, it was a risky decision. It was a tough decision. You are a grandmaster. You are a champion of your country. You know, uh, that time there was kindness in our police system. So when I was driving and, and police would stop me, it's small country, you know, and they were like, and there's a chess country. They're like, oh, you're, I know you somewhere. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm chess grandmaster. And like, oh, you know, you know, yes, you did that mistake when you were driving. And like, yeah, 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 sorry, officer. Like, of course, go. So I had lots of privileges there when I was grandmaster, chess grandmaster in Armenia. And I broke everything. No more, no more comeback. I I took fire and, and, and fired all the bridges to start something new. This is not easy. This is really tough. And I don't say that, ah, oh, this kind of master should also do that. Whoever feels miserable, they should do that. No, I don't say that. But unfortunately, that's true. That many grandmasters, they are chess grandmasters. They are in the top hundreds in the world, but they are not happy. So what I try to do with my students through chess, I try to make them happy, happy people first. And if at some point they realize that they don't want chess, I'm like, very good. What do you like more? Oh, you like piano. Okay, go there. And I told to some of my students, like, okay, you need to, you need to, you need to retire from this. This is not what you do, what you want. And they figured out, like, really, they wanted something else. And they, and they switched to that. I felt the winner. I don't have that ego. I could make them champions and like, yeah, I'm the best coach. Da, da, da. I don't try to do that with my students. And I don't try to do that with our Chessman students. So the part we have at blogs, I never write articles where people are, what people are looking for, Google. Of course, I have my SEO people who would look for keywords, and this is what people are looking for. But my approach is always making people happy first, uh, trying to win themselves first, and then, okay, if really you want chess, this is, this is what the way looks like to the growth. 
And what do you think makes people, I mean, one thing that makes people happy, I think when they learn anything is understanding more and more nuances of this activity that they love, whether it's chess or martial arts or business or whatever. And, um, and I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between like understanding something and the pleasure of deeply understanding something. There's, there's like a difference. And you were telling me once about this experience in, in poker that you had where you first got on a, a poker coach and this was like a revelation to you, what, what he explained to you. Uh, Right, right. So that, that was a big thing for me. I thought I'm very good at, at poker. I was already beating the game very, very nicely. I would enjoy my expensive apartment and every night, jacuzzi, of course, with some nice drinks. And then I got a, and then there was a guy who beat me a few times in a row very badly. I analyzed the game to see if I was unlucky, but then I thought, no, 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 I was not unlucky. This guy just dominates me not just wins me, badly dominates me. Like, ah, I'm not so good anymore. My ego is hard, it weighed. So I like, okay, let's find the coach. So I found the coach, coach checked my games. I'm like, you are weak. <laughs> then I'm like, wait, 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 I'm winning the game. Look, They're like, yeah, you win the game, but you are weak. You have so many weaknesses that anyone who is a little bit better than you can exploit you badly. That was a big revolution to me. Like, okay, that day I sold my Mercedes car. I was living like, ha, ah, I'm a grand master. I have Mercedes car and I have everything I want. I have my jacuzzi. I sold my car. I hired five coaches who would work with me. Everyone with separate area of poker because I realized, realized how weak I am, how better I can be. And that was one of the probably best decisions I've ever made to learn to invest in myself. And that's also something I learned in the future all my life. I always try to invest in myself. And then you, you, you were telling me you made this list of all the things that you thought you understood, the bold, unbold list. Yeah, so what I was doing, James, I, they would, t you know, five, strong poker coaches whom you are spending to, whom you are paying a lot they are teaching you a lot <laughs> and there would there would be days i would i would have two lessons with different coaches and they would give me books courses articles their things to learn and i would learn 100 things at, at, in one day and then with my weak memory i could not remember that all so in, in poker, when you don't learn everything, it's, it's quite expensive <laughs> because you pay right away with your mistakes. And it's poker, you pay money. I'm like, no, 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 this is not the way. I have five coaches. I pay them a lot. They are best. And they teach me so much, but I, whatever I study, I don't learn. That was a big thing for me. Like, study and learning, it's not the same. It's not the same at all. So then I found this technique for me that I used over and over again. And then years and years, I taught others. Some people started to use that. Uh, and everyone, whatever I will tell you now, they are free to read an article or write a book about that, that, that thing. So here is what I came up. I would not just write down all hundred things I have learned. This is something popular. Write down notes, take notes, what you have learned. But what I would do is this. Uh, I would bold everyone just in the word document or google document bold and before the game i would go i would go through that list and then play with playing i would try to digest the information i have so you eat and you digest right so i would try to digest that information then at the end of the session i would come back and review my list that hundreds of notes and like okay this is i remembered remembered oh about this i forgot so whatever I remembered, I would unbold them and I would keep others bolded. So next time I come, it's, it's not hundreds, hundreds, no, there are 30. 70, I, I know them more or less. The 30 where I'm going to focus because my brain, my million minions, they cannot focus on hundred things. Okay, focus on this 30. And then I would play, come back and see how much did I remember. And so like that, I would bold and unbold whatever I have learned. Sorry, whatever I have studied. 
and this is the way I, I would learn things. This is the way it would go to my uh, unconscious competence, where unconsciously I would know things. And that came, this unconscious competence came from one of my poker coaches. So many things I, I have learned from my different coaches that I took to chess. I had poker coaches, I had uh, chess coaches, I had Kofu coaches, I had different coaches. So one thing did my coach, a first ever coach. I said, okay, I want to become better. And he's like, okay, send me your last games. It calls, in poker, it calls hands. I had about 100,000 hands played in the last month. And he said, like, send me. Like, coach, I was not in a good mood. That's not really me. Let me send you the previous month's uh, notes. It's like, no, 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 send me this. Like, why? It's not me. He said, look, if, if I wake you up in the middle of the night, and I would, I would ask you, would you, would, you do, would you do this stupid move? You would say no. Why? Because it's your unconscious competence. You deeply understand that. So I want to see your games of the last 100,000 games when you were not in a good mood because I want to see what you understand and what you not deeply understand. What are your, in your conscious competence and what are in your unconscious competence? I want to see what are there. This is where I, okay, conscious competence, unconscious competence. I need to learn things so deeply that they are in my unconscious competence. This is, this is, this was the way that I took with me whatever I now do. I read books, I take notes, I bold, I'm bold, I have my list and I go through them all the time and I try to take them with me to my unconscious competence where they deeply have their place. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what, where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. I think this is such an important technique and I've started using it in chess, but I could see even how it applies to like investing. Like you think you know things about the way you invest, like, oh, don't invest in this type of company, invest in this type of company. Don't invest with this amount of money, invest with this amount of money. And it's so easy to convince yourself to break the rules because you might not really understand deeply why those rules for yourself exist. You just hear them, oh, Warren Buffett says this, or some other investor says this. So you think you understand them, but when it comes to your own personal choices, 
you make all sorts of excuses why you didn't do something kind of means you don't deeply understand why did Warren Buffett suggest this? Why does some other teacher say this? Why is this a good idea? I find this technique to be aware of these. What concepts are you aware of, but you're not deeply aware of? I find that to be extremely a valuable insight into the process of, of learning. So I was amazed when you told me that story. And I, and I think many, many people, especially in charge, they are doing these mistakes. They are trying to memorize some variations. If, if they played that, I played this. If they played that, I played this. But that just doesn't work. And because, because ch chess companies, they are smart, they have VCs, they have, they have, they have CEO smart people, they sell people what they, what they want. And they sell this dream, memorize variation, but it doesn't work. What works is understanding. If you understand one concept, even if you forget that thing, you will, you will find the solution. And I, I sort of like, okay, I'm reading one book. I finished that book. After one month, what do I remember from that book? I found it's like very little. Oh, so why do I read so many books if I remember so little? My ego is happy. My ego is like, oh, I read that, 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 that. I studied that, that, that. My ego makes happy like I'm, I'm improving. But like, wait, ego, dear ego. You don't really improve. You are just studying. You are not learning. So then I came back and I started to really spend time with the books. To I, I, usually I read with my ebooks. I would highlight. I would export the notes. I would bold them, and I would try to use in my life whatever I have learned. And time to time I would come back to my books, and this is something I am absolutely agree with. Naval Ravikant. I love this advice. He says it's better to just have hundred books and read them over and over again than read thousands of books. Yeah. I because this is where where you where you learn, not study, and then you don't really like you don't really learn anything. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. And again, you're the only chess player I know who quotes Ryan Holiday, Naval Ravikant, Derek Sivers, Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins, all of these, all of these people. And I think that that plays a large role in how you've learned and how you teach. Let me ask you something. You mentioned before study, practice, fix, study, practice, fix. And that's often called a uh, deliberate practice. So people who believe in this 10,000 hour rule, that's what's called deliberate practice. If you do 10,000 hours of deliberate practice where you repeat the same thing over and you fix and you work with a coach and then you fix and then you do it and a coach analyzes and you fix. But there's another concept called deliberate play where instead of doing the same thing over and over again, you you mix it up a little bit. You play, you experiment, you try something new. Chess is something where it is very repetitive. If you play a certain opening, you'll always play the same moves when your opponent, you know, gets into the same opening. What way in chess or poker or whatever can you try deliberate play where you experiment with things as you're learning? Well, I had a student, he became my student, also a chess move student at the same time. And he raised 500 rating points in about six months. It was crazy. He was, he loved chess so much during the, he was a kid. He was during the school. He would just sneak and he would, he would play chess with his, with his phone. He learned all our openings very deeply. He must have a very good memory. Uh, not as good memory as the way we did. He would study, he would play and he would fix. Two times a week, we would fix his mistakes. After six months, when he studied from the courses, he plays them. He brings me to the games and say like, what well, did I wrongly? And I fix them. Imagine what happens with him in the six months. He not studied. He learned things. He was very happy with that. And I said, okay, Print. His name is Print. He's from Thailand. Like, Print, I have here for you good news and bad news from where to start. He said, like, bad news. Like, okay. No more chess mode openings. Huh. Like, what? I am killing everyone with chess mode openings. With everything you taught me, I am just dominating the game. What did you say? And chess mode openings, you should be proud that I am beating everyone with, with openings you have created. And I'm like, yeah, but now you are in your absolute comfort zone. We are going to take you out of comfort zone. Now, we are going to learn new openings. I'm going to take you absolutely from comfort zone. The good news, you are going to grow. At one period, maybe you will stuck there, but 
this is where I believe. Anytime you are in comfort zone, in absolute comfort zone, and if you want to grow, you need to move on. So we have, we have students who come up and say, oh, you know, I'm mature, I am 75, I play in clubs, and I want to have fun. What should I do with my openings? I said, like, don't change your openings, just play, have fun. But if somebody is like 13 years old, want to become a grandmaster, or like, or some, some business people, somebody in marketing, some, any, anywhere, if they want very much to grow, I'm like, get out of the comfort zone. Get in the comfort zone, good, continue. But when you're in absolute comfort zone, get out of that. So probably this is how I would answer your question about the 10,000 rule. I think there is a balance. When you grow, you do that, 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 that. And when you are in absolute comfort zone, maybe it's time to think about getting out of So there. that's interesting. So he was at the six month point. I'm at the two month point with you. So I've got another four months to go before uh, I have to change the... Well, there, there, there is a difference. He, he, you, don't, you, don't, you don't go to school, he goes and you don't sneak. But, but maybe you sneak, yeah? Maybe you sneak during the meetings and you are playing chess, Oh yeah, right? I, all the time. <laughs> I, I don't have I don't have a phone okay. call with anyone unless I'm also like looking at the chessboard. So Okay, good. So you have four months. <laughs> so so you know, this is just a random question, but you know, right now the technology is eventually gonna be there where we could put like the internet in our head. Like you could have some chip in your brain and you could have you know, we had this whole controversy about chess cheating with a computer, but soon the computer's gonna be in your head. What happens to games like chess or even poker when the computer's in your head and basically everybody's cheating? Like, do you think chess will lose its cultural significance? Well, this is something very, very much hurting with me whenever people are cheating. But why it, why it hurts me, it's because of the society traps that we all create together. Not just there are society traps, but I think we also all create together. And I very rarely share on my social someone's success because this is the way when somebody is winning something and they are getting thousands of shares. This is how kids are looking at this and like, oh, mm. this is what looks like success. And then people are starting to not care what's the cost of winning, what's the price of winning. Is it your value? Is it your soul? Are you going to sell your soul in order to win and in order to get these likes and shares because people are like, wow, you won. This hurts me very much. I think this is one of the biggest society traps. Just, just win, 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 no matter what price you pay. I think this is very painful. So cheating is very painful topic to me. I think just what will happen is there will be all the time more and more strict rules, just like it happens now. 20 years ago, you could go to the game with a phone with your, in your pocket. Now you cannot go. 10 years ago, you could have a watch. Now you cannot do. Seven years ago, you could just enter to the playing room. Now they will scan you. Mm. And just like that, I think the more society traps, the more people are wanting to win no matter of the price, even if they sell their soul, there will be more technologies, just like virus, antivirus, virus, antivirus. The same way they will be cheating, and they cheating, cheating, and they cheating. But I, I don't think it will ever be end. And chess will never be stopped. It will just, it's, it's a game that came from so many years. It will forever go. Just there will be more technologies to cheat and more te technologies to prevent cheating. And, you know, now, obviously, your main focus is chessmood.com, hundreds and hundreds of hours of video on the site, your blogs on the site. You're an, you're an excellent writer, excellent storyteller. Obviously, people could tell that just from this podcast. What keeps you up? at night now, if you're stressed or waking up in the middle of the night anxious about something, what is it that you're worried about? Uh, well, there are a few things. The first thing is that why I started trust mode, because I was living in Thailand. I was playing poker. I, I, I just got to my absolute dream life. Playing poker just a few hours a day. And it's not just work. It's a pleasure work. I would wake up at 8 a.m. and I couldn't like go to do things. I would just immediately jump to my laptop, very excited, like a kid who will play with his toy. I would open my laptop. I 
bring to my like pineapples, my like all the tropical foods from Thailand next to me as my breakfast and let's go. And it's not just I'm going to sell my four hours to, 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 to my freedom. I'm going to enjoy my four hours. I would play three to four hours a day and then during the day, what, what to do the next thing? Freedom, do whatever you want. You want to go to the beach, which is just two minutes out of you. There is a motorbike in the first floor. Oh, you want to to swimming pool? You have you can jump from your balcony to the swimming pool. I had everything the young man could dream about. Uh, but then, I, when I, what I saw was happening in the chess world. It hurt hurt me very much. When I saw millions of people wanting to become better. And hundreds of companies who understand that and they want to make money. Because unfortunately, this is what society thinks. Make money, this is success. And they don't care if they, if they lie to these million people, they bullshit that million people, they sell a bad uh, promise, they just sell it. It hurted me very much. So I was like, okay, somebody should solve this. One day somebody will solve this. And like, what if I solve this? So I came back from that. My dream, dream life was tough decision. I left everything. I came back to, to my country because that time already I started to brainstorm about that. I even hired a few people. And I thought like, no way. Like, as in the movies, King always goes in front of the army. I should be in front of my army. There is no way I am just lying in, under the coconut tree, uh, drinking a cocktail in my pineapple and then like why you didn't do that task i should be in front of them so i came back and started that my main pain is so many people are wanting to improve there are just a few people i can count them on my fingers that genuinely wants to help them and there were hundreds of companies now there are not hundreds i think the big uh, sharks ate all of them there are a few companies who just left and write selling things. And that, that is hard. That is hard for me. That's pain. That is painful. So I am like kind of that Superman, that uh, guy who comes and rescue the people. I'm trying to do that. Like, no, 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 no. You are buying all that things. You are spending all that money and you are frustrated why it doesn't work. You are just lied because there were there are VCs who need money, and VCs to make the money they are putting harsh deadline to CEOs, and if the CEO doesn't make that they will be fired. So CEO needs to sell how there is no way just to sell so much to in order to convince that VCs that they are good, in order not not just to lie. So there are lots of pain to me what's happening in the world in the chess world. So I'm trying to as much as possible to rescue as many people as possible, show them like, this is the way, guys. This is how you improve and at the same time have fun and at the same time not just improve your chess, but your life as well. So this is what I try to do through my teachings, through my articles, through, through everything. And at the same time, it's my, uh, my duty to learn from people like Ryan Holiday, Tony Robbins and others to learn things and to trust to share these things with them. Minions are with me. Yeah, I talked with them carefully why we want to do that. And and with chess mood itself, it's a business. Like I remember with my first business, I would wake up all the time in the middle of the night worried if I was going to make payroll or not. Like, do you ever like what's your biggest anxieties with you know this being your your first real? And you know now you're t today you're celebrating the fifth year anniversary of this business. Like, what's your biggest anxieties over the next year, two years? Like, what do you think about? Uh, when I started, I, I had anxiety because I didn't know where I'm going. It's like you are sailing, there is a storm, there is a fog, and you don't see anything. You don't understand. I had just my disciplines. I knew I wanted very much. I knew I have these millions of minions with me, but I, did, I was not sure with my direction. Now... Very rarely I have any anxiety. Uh, I tried to build the company of my dream. And one of my dream was it's not become, never becomes a corporation and we never have any employees. But we have teammates. And I never ever call them employees. 
they are all my teammates. That was my dream. And my dream was to make a company when, where everyone has a freedom, because I think freedom is a big part of happiness. Everyone has a freedom. At the same time, they have responsibility. So now how we work, everyone can call me and say, I'm a bit tired. I take three days uh, rest. Is it okay? I'm like, yeah, of course. But at the same time, they have responsibility. So whenever we have in something big, they are staying with me, even if we if don't sleep that night. Uh, the same way I didn't want to have investors. I wanted to have friends. So when I was starting chess mode, I got some interesting offers. Maybe people will realize that, okay, it's a chess grandmaster. He figured out how to become a chess grandmaster. He will figure out also how to make a business. Let's invest there. And I would sell, and I would say, no, everyone. And I would, he said, wake up 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. I would play poker to cover the salaries. I would bootstrap everything. Because my dream was to have another company. To not have investors, but to have friends. And I'm a very lucky person. I have a tattoo on my hand, which, which is written lucky. And this is how it worked. We got investors, but it's our students. Our students said, like, what, is, what the heck are you doing? We want to invest. Can we? They were brilliant people. The, our lead investor even became my godfather. We became very close with him. Soon I'm going to go to his birthday uh, to Tunisia. And we got these relationships where, you know, a kid who is 12 years old trying to achieve something in life, has some dreams, and has parents, uncles, aunts who are always supporting them, who are always going to show them direction. So just, just the same way. I got such an investors, one after another, such a brilliant people. I got mentors who are helping with me, me with my direction, uh, showing me whenever I'm losing my objectivity, showing me the way to go when I'm lost and I need advice. I don't have any anxiety now. I am so freely going ahead. Only thing I'm trying to trying to do is never get trapped with society traps, never to lose my control, never let my ambitions to eat myself. And the way I do is usually I do I I I go over and over through stoicism, through Ryan Holiday's books, to keep myself uh, in my hands, to never lose my control. Otherwise, I don't have any anxieties. I am so happy how the way goes i am i have so many insur so much insurances i have so many people covering my back and helping me it i could just dream about i could not dream about even to have so many people who would support me on this journey when i started this i have a take gregorian I've, I've known you for a short while but we've had so many great discussions like this one and I've learned so much from you and it's been been a gratifying experience. Again, congratulations, chessmood.com's fifth anniversary. I have spent so many hours on that website, more hours on that website than probably any other website ever. And uh, <laughs> it's helped me quite a bit in just the past two months since since I've been working with you and working with it. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Like this has been... So, Every one of these techniques from the bold unbold to the minions to, you know, all the techniques we discussed in between, uh, I've learned so much from. So thank you again for for coming on the podcast and and continue to have good luck with chessmood.com. And I encourage everyone, whether you play chess or not, I encourage everyone to try out chessmood.com. Thank you very much, James. And you have done a lot to me. You you mentored me. You, I have learned so many lessons from you. And you are one of the brilliant people who are in my life. I am thankful as well for whatever you are doing for me and for everything you do for the people and the way you do these things. It's just so inspiring. And I learned so much from you myself. Well, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you, I appreciate that. In Tresto, Sucubitril Volsartan Tablets is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over one million people with heart failure. 
It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran. Or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help. Diving deep into your passions has never been easier. Thanks to Amazon Prime. You get all-in-one access to the things you need so you can get more out of the things you love. With a range of services including Prime Video, Amazon Music, and Prime Fast free shipping. Amazon Prime is like your personal mission control for all the things that inspire. From shopping and streaming to saving, it's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you're into. It's on Prime.